Amen. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. And that is, that is, that is nice to know that God really, He's got it all figured out. Hallelujah. He knows so much better than we know. Amen. Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. Like, yeah, well, this message is for, well, really it's for everyone, but it's for everyone who thinks that they can do no wrong. <laughs> this is for you. Everybody's looking around. Who's that? There's three fingers pointing back. <laughs> this message for, for those who think, or for those who think that maybe perhaps they have already reached their. Christian, fullest Christian potential to where they have it all figured out. They already know every single law. They keep every single law. That maybe this is for you. Oh wait a minute. This also that also this message also goes out to to all those who think that all they do is wrong. About all they do is right. Every time they turn around, they're doing something wrong. Every time they turn around, they are falling and slipping up, maybe. Doing something they shouldn't do. This is for you, too. Is there anybody here at all like that? Yeah. All right, because all the perfect people, they were pointing fingers. <laughs> this must be for them. No, this must be for them. Oh, wait a minute. This might be for me. Let's look in Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61. This may be a little bit quicker for you to find it than me. No, no, I found it before you did. Isaiah chapter 61. I want us to look at what Isaiah says. An amazing proclamation. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. I love this good tidings. Every time I hear the word tidings, I think of what? Uh, Christmas. <laughs> I think of Christmas. Good tidings. Good tidings to you. Good tidings. Right? Who says good tidings? Nobody really says good tidings. Good tidings essentially is good news. Yes. Good information. He says good, good news because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good news to the meek. Now when I look at meek, I look at this. At the humble, the submissive, the tame, the gentle, the kind. Unfortunately, whenever I said this message goes out to all of those who are thinking that they can do no wrong, then this message wouldn't be for them. If you think about that, uh, the people who think that they can do no wrong or the people who think that they've already arrived at the supernatural spot to where they can't be touched or they're literally perfect, that would be as if it would be the, the Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees thought that they had already had it all figured out they had already arrived and nobody else knew more than they did about God. That's not someone who's humble at all, is it? That's not so someone who's humble constantly or submissive constantly goes before the Lord and says, Lord, I know, think of it, I know that in my body there is nothing that is as holy as you are. I fall short of your glory, right? There is none righteous, no, not one. We have all committed sins. We've all fallen short of His glory. And so when you look at this word, He has anointed me to preach the good tidings or the good news to the meek, that would mean that this good news is for all of those people who realize what I said before, that constantly they keep fouling up. Constantly they keep messing up. They don't quite meet the supernatural standards that God has set before them. I want us to understand this before we keep going. That God's laws 
in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, God's Word was given to help His people to have a moral compass. Are you, are you listening? Amen. All of the Old Testament was, was set aside here. It was God's people. These are my people. God says, I want you to be my people and I want to be your God. Is that okay with you? That's what God was saying. Is that okay with you? Now imagine if God were looking down upon us right now and saying the same thing. I want to be your God and I want to be I want you all to be my people. Could you imagine now if, if this were God, God would say, Is that okay with you people? What would you say? Yes. Yes, yes, that would be okay. We want to be your people. And, and God's like, okay, well, I'll tell you, because the rest of the world, they continue to live however they want to live. They live like crazy people, literally. They live crazy. They live, but if you're going to be my people, then I want to tell you a few things. A few things that end up being a few books, right? A few, I, want to, I want to tell you like how I want you to live. I want you to live differently than the rest of the people. That's what he said in the Old Testament. He said, because you're going to be my people. I totally know this too. In fact, uh, uh, I like this being live. It really restricts me. <laughs> but I'm going to do this anyway. <laughs> there was a time way back in the 80s, years and years ago. <laughs> When my sister came home and she was wearing this outfit that she borrowed from someone else. It didn't go over all that well in our house. Because this was a little not well, according to our standards. And so the wrath of my parents came down upon my sister. Which was one of the very few times that it didn't come down upon me. So I praise the Lord. But my parents wanted to make sure that if, since she was going to be in our family, there were certain rules, certain guidelines, certain standards about the way that we present ourselves. Because if you're going to be in our family, this is how I want you to live. Now, so you understand what I'm getting at here. God did the same way with His people. He said, look, there are certain standards and guidelines. I don't want the women to be dressing like men. And I definitely, and even today, I definitely don't want the men to be dressing like women. He said that that was his standards. In the scripture, in the Bible, he told his people, this is how I want you to dress. This is how I want you to act. This is what I want you to do. This is what I want you not to do. There were certain things, certain guidelines that he put in place because he wanted his people to understand this, that they were a different type of people than the rest of the world. Right? We got that? Right. Yes. So God put his laws in place to help his, his people to have a moral compass, to keep them safe from certain diseases. He, he put these put uh, these certain restrictions from things that they can eat because it's not healthy for them to have eaten these things at that time. Certain ways that they are supposed to take care of their home. If there's certain things in their home that can make them sick, then he had the law that would say this is what you're supposed to do in that home. It's to help them to have a more honest, listen, he gave the law to help the people of God to have a more honest community. To help them to get along with each other, to have, an honor, to have rules on civil arguments and disagreements. Uh, to, 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 now, listen, here's the biggest thing. He put these rules in place to point out our need for divine help. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Because he knew that we could never live up to his standards. He put them in place on purpose so that we would understand that there is, it's just too difficult for me to live according to these restrictions. Because I'm human, I'm flesh, and my mind is bent towards sin. So God placed these there so that we would understand that we need His divine help. Then He gave certain uh, um, uh, laws so that they could redeem themselves for a period of time every time that they would mess up. We are all constantly failing. Amen? Yeah. 
We are all falling short of God's glory. And the entire world needs a Savior. Yes. The entire world needs someone to forgive them of their sinful behavior. Now, Isaiah 61 says this. Let's say it again. Isaiah 61 verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the good news or the good tidings unto the meek. And have sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Now, I don't know about you, but there have been a few times in my life that I have been brokenhearted. Yes. There are people here today that are probably brokenhearted about a handful of things. But look at what he says here to bind up the brokenhearted. There are several different versions of, or several different meanings to this word bind, but I'm just going to say this to repair or to secure, or to fix, to fix and repair the brokenhearted. Oh, I don't know. I need this. Do you not need this, God? Yes, I do. And think the Spirit of the Lord God, and Isaiah is saying this. Isaiah is saying the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me to preach to you the good news, to preach to you good tidings unto the meek. Again, you have to be meek in order to receive the good tidings. You have to be humble. You can't walk around thinking that everything that you do is okay. Or I have arrived or I'm so much better than everybody else. You have to humbly realize this. You need a Savior. Amen. You have to come humbly. And if you come humbly, then you will receive help with your broken heart. Look at this. To proclaim liberty to the captives. I love this word, liberty to the captives. And think about it. When you hear liberty, what do you hear? Freedom. freedom, right? Freedom to the captives. And it goes more than just, this is so deep, it's freedom to the captives. In just a moment, we're going to read almost the same thing. And we're uh, let's, let's just keep going. Freedom to the captives. And, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Have you ever felt like that you were just restricted and bound and you could not do what you really wanted to do? Yes. Oh, I feel so sad for the people that 300 years ago, they had to abide by the laws of their country and they had to suppress their feelings about Christ Jesus. Or they would be persecuted. Thank God for America. Because we still have that First Amendment that says that we can worship our God. But look, look at this, verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of our Lord. He's trying to let you know that He is here to proclaim that the Lord one day is going to make it all okay. Amen. Think of it. To proclaim the acceptable year of our Lord. And so He's saying, God is going to set it all straight. He's going to make it all good. Those of you who are broken hearted, He is here to fix it. Those of you who, are, uh, who need uh, the Lord to help you to have liberty, he is, he is going to do it. And the day of vengeance of our God. That means this. God one day is going to repay all the evil that has befallen the church. For all the evil that has befallen His people. Amen. That's what Isaiah is trying to say. Think of it. How many people have had somebody do something wrong to them and they just had to just take it? Oh, that's the worst thing, isn't it? Oh, man, they hurt me. Oh, I want so desperately to lash out and just tell them off. Is that just me or is that everybody else? Yeah. Okay, but that's just you, Pastor. Everybody else, we've got it. Right? <laughs> Amen. Gotcha. Everybody else is the, they can do no wrong. Apparently, you're in the second group. The first group was me. But look, I, you just want to tell somebody, you done wrong and that was not fair, right? But this is what he's trying to say to proclaim the day of vengeance on our God, of our God. God one day is going to set it all straight. He's going to fix it and make it all right. But look at the rest of this. And to comfort all that mourn. Oh, I love that. If you're broken hearted, Jesus has come to comfort you, to give you a hope, to give you a peace that passes all understanding. For those who are so calloused in their heart that they do not have feelings towards anyone else other than themselves, it is a sad, sad state that you're in. That is why the ministers 
pray that God sends Holy Spirit conviction upon those who are sinning. We want them to be convicted of their sins. We want them to understand that the way that they're living is going to lead them in the wrong path. Amen? Yeah. Let's look over at Luke chapter 4, if you would, just for a moment. Luke chapter 4. Did anybody see this coming? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you in Luke chapter 4? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Says the minister. Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse 14. Whoever's there first, say amen. Amen. All right, it's a tie. <laughs> Thank you very much. Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. There it is. Look at this. The Spirit of the Lord was with who? Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord had fallen upon who? Jesus. Jesus. And in the Old Testament, we just read that the Spirit of the Lord had fallen upon Isaiah. Yes. So Jesus returned into, into the power of the Spirit in Galilee. And there went out a fame of Him through all the region round about. And He taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Oh, that is amazing, isn't it? That means that the people, listen, when people start saying, oh, Jesus was just a prophet, everybody knew that Jesus wasn't holy. Jesus was just a regular person. But look at this verse. And he taught in their synagogues being glorified by all. People were glorifying Jesus. Amen. That might not be a good idea to glorify Jesus in front of the Pharisees who thought that they were better than Jesus, is it? Yeah. Not a good thing there. So think of it. The Pharisees now were probably very bit out of shape, mostly because they were spending their entire life trying to make a good resume so that everybody else would think that they are all that and a basket of french fries. Right? That bag of chips. Same thing, right? That's what they continuously wanted everybody to look at them and say, they're the authority, they're the greatest, they're the wonderful you know, followers of the Lord. They know it all. They're the know-it-alls. Have you ever known a know-it-all who didn't know anything? No, yes. These were the know-it-alls, and the know-it-alls were all that happy because they were actually glorifying Jesus. Where? In the synagogues. That meant that, that this was all oh, this was horrible. Because that meant that the preacher wasn't the head cheese. Head cheese, whatever, I don't even know what. The, and he wasn't the head honcho anymore. Jesus, who was just a regular person, he comes along. And now he's in charge. Or they're glorifying him. This isn't a good thing for those who are not humble. The people who are meek and humble, this is a wonderful thing because Jesus is revealing that he is the Messiah. That He is the Savior. And they're excited to hear about Jesus. Verse 16. And He came to Nazareth where He had been brought up. And as His custom was, He went into the synagogue. Ah! Oh, he goes to His hometown and He goes into the middle of the city and goes right into the church. Oh no! Oh, But think of it. Everybody knew Him as a child. Everybody knew Him whenever He was just a youngster. And so now they're like, oh, here comes Jesus to town, and he's going right in that church, and he's going to be, he, uh, he's not going to sit, not behind my pulpit. I can guarantee that this is the way that those Pharisees were thinking. And so Jesus walks in and says, and there, uh, uh, let's read it again, 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as it was his custom, he went in the Sabbath. Uh, went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up and read. <laughs> oh, he did. Uh, uh, it, it indicates here that the scripture makes it look like that he didn't even have an invitation. He just walked right in and stood up and took over. <laughs> Jesus can just come right in and take over. Yeah. I think if we were a good, good, Bible-believing, fundamental church, that Jesus is welcome to come in and take over. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. We just want Him to come in and take over. We were praying that Jesus would come in and take over. 
Please, Lord, come in. And we even pray, Lord, please even let the message that the minister speaks, let that be directly from God. That's what we want. We want it to be directly from God. We want Jesus to come in and take over. Nothing has changed after this day with the true church. We want Him to come in and take over. We, we would much rather hear, and I think this this could, you would much rather hear someone singing a song of worship with a sincere heart any day over someone who has practiced for 1,500 hours to give you a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Yeah. And it's all about that. Right. Wouldn't you rather hear somebody give it directly yeah. from their heart? You yeah. want the real deal. Amen. The same should go for ministers too. I would much rather hear a minister who is truly preaching the Word of God with true passion, not for a show. Right. Wouldn't you? Because if it's for a show, then, tech, then more than likely it is not from God. Amen. God can use anything that anybody says for His glory. Trust me, I know it's true. But you would much rather hear an anointed minister speaking the Word yes. of God. Amen? Amen. Yes. That's exactly what we're trying to do here. He stands up and he reads. Verse 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Well, deja vu. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. This is going to seem so eerily familiar. Verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the... Poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and to reco and recovering the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Amen. Our Jesus came and He delivered. He delivered and fulfilled this prophecy that the year of our Lord Jesus was going to come one day. The Messiah was going to come one day and do this, and He did it right here. Verse 20, And He closed the book and He gave it again to the minister and sat down. I love that. He takes the Bible, gives it to the preacher, and He says, Thank you very much. And He sits down. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. I, Jesus is like the greatest. Amen? Not just for this, because this makes it even better than even the greatest can possibly be. It's like saying Jesus is the greatest thing ever. And ever and ever and ever. I mean, He's the greatest of all time, but this is amazing. He goes in, He reads this, and sits down. Love it. Drops the mic. Verse 21. And He began to say unto them, This day is the Scripture fulfilled in your ears. He's saying, this is done. I'm the man that Isaiah talked about. This is the year of our Lord. This is when it all goes down. I'm here. I delivered. Praise the Lord. Right? I love it. I love it. I love it. Let's look at another verse here, if you could, please. Romans chapter 7, please. Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Know ye not, brethren... For I speak to them that know the law. All right. Let's say it again. Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Know ye not, that means don't you know, brothers and sisters, know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. He's trying to say, I'm talking to you people that know the Old Testament. I'm talking to you people that know the books of Moses, that knows the law, the compass, the moral compass that God put forth, the, the all of those laws in the Old Testament. I'm talking to you. Now think of it. He's not talking to the Gentiles because more than likely the Gentiles, they don't know the Old Testament. They have no idea who the people or the church that is at Rome. So more than likely, there were Jews at Rome. This particular segment is to those individuals, not the Gentiles. The Gentiles were godless heathens, no question about it. Amen? Amen. <laughs> they, had, they were no question. So they were just happy that they could actually have salvation from their sins when they realized that they were sinners, when they were humbled, Amen. when they came to the Lord and realized, oh no, I have been living my life and it is a disgusting sight before the Lord. They realized they were sinners and they were begging God, please give me, give me an opportunity to be in your family. Yes. 
That's exactly what has to happen to true, genuine, born-again believers. You can't come in thinking, well, I already have clout before I walk in. No, you have nothing before you walk in. All your righteousnesses are, are as filthy rags before you walk into the family of God. You have to come there knowing that you need a Savior. Now here, verse 1 says, I'm talking to those who know how, this is verse 7 the rest of it, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Now see, those people he's trying to say, look, I know you constantly have to be looking at the law to bring you about your salvation. You have to constantly be living and trying your best to reach those standards. And if you don't reach those standards, then you've got to turn around through sacrifices and different customs. You have to do your best to hope that God will forgive you just for a small amount of time for the next time that you have to come back and pay, have repentance for your sins. Right. He's saying, uh, you used to have, this This law had dominion over you. It had control over you. You constantly were looking at the law saying, I've broken this, I've broken this, oh, I've broken this, now I've got... Now look, he's trying to say this, verse 2. Look at this, look at this parallel that he gives on here. He says, for the woman who hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as she liveth. He's trying to say that if a woman marries, listen, marries into a, and has a husband, that she is bound by that union. She has to stick with that commitment that she made. Right? That's what it says. But the reason why he says that is because he's trying to bring about the illustration that as long as you are still in that union, you have to live by that union. Right? Now he says this. It says, the husband is bound by the law to, uh, uh, let's see, who hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth, but if the husband is dead, listen, but if the husband is dead, she is loosened from the law of her husband. It's not trying to give you doctrine over how you're supposed to conduct your marriage lives. He's trying to give you an illustration as this, that you were married to the law. That's what he's trying to say. You were at one point married to the law, but now, well, let's keep reading. Who then, if while her husband liveth, she married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law. Listen, what they're trying, what the, what the writer is trying to say, it, again, it isn't trying to give you marital counseling. He's trying to say this. You can't dabble around and try to continue to keep living according to the laws and think that that's going to get you saved. Are you listening to me? That's the parallel he's trying to say. You can't do that. You can't have lived by the law and think that's going to get you saved and then, oh, well, we're going to add Jesus all alongside and that's added insurance. It's not that way. Jesus isn't an insurance policy to hope that you make it into heaven. Jesus is the only way to heaven. You can't dabble with both. You can't look at both of them and think both of them are going to get you into heaven. Understand? It's very simple. So we have to look at what it's saying and understand in context why he's writing these things. Amen. They will. <laughs> Thank you. But look at this. But if her husband be dead, she is look. She is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. He's trying to say that once that is completely done and over with, then they can move on to the next stage. Verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren and sister, and I'm sorry I took the liberty to add that myself, ye also are become, look, you also are become dead to the law. Do you understand? He's trying to say you no longer have to worry about living the ways of the law in order to hope that you will have everlasting life or the promises of God. You don't do that anymore. It says by the body of Christ that you should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Do you understand how fortunate that we are to live in the day that we live in? Thank the Lord for the church age. Thank the Lord that we came after Jesus died on the cross. Thank the Lord that we came and that He offered salvation to the Gentiles. Because we would have been looking at the law and thinking, oh, that, that is completely foreign to us. 
But now we have been, we have the law, and now that law, let's keep reading here. Verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, it says, the motions of sin or the sinful impulses which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. It's trying to say this, that when the law was here, that no matter how we lived our life, it was still going to bring about death. Yes. Everlasting death and everlasting punishment, no matter how it was going to be. The writer here has been anointed by the Lord to finally set this straight. Law versus grace. Law versus grace. Verse 6. But now we are delivered. Look, now we're delivered from the law. This means that now you have been risen. You are now able to rise above the law. You've been delivered from living in bondage according to the laws of God. Think of it. You are no longer handcuffed to these laws. Now listen. It says that being dead in which we were held that we should serve in the newness of spirit. Do you see this? Now we serve in the newness of spirit. We no longer serve the law so that we can receive salvation. We serve Jesus. Amen. We don't keep the law because we have to. We keep the law because Jesus wants us to. Amen. Do you understand how beautiful that is? We no longer think of it. Again, it's not because we have to try to live a righteous life. It's because we want to live a righteous life. Amen. It's not because we have to go to church. It's because we want to go to church. It's not that we have to keep this commandment or we have to keep that commandment. It's that we get to keep that commandment so that we can let Jesus know how thankful and grateful we are for His Amen. Amen. and salvation. Amen. Amen. That is who we are. To make God look at us and say, "How enter in thou good and faithful servant, then you are missing something. Yes. If you think for one second that you trying to keep all that stuff is going to get you into heaven, the writer here is saying you are confused, you are wrong. Verse 6, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead in which we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Verse 7, everybody, this is where everybody wants to stop, but we are going to keep going because this is definitely uh, something that people don't listen to. Listen, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. No. Say, no, 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 no. Don't, do not think that the Old Testament and the laws are sinful. Don't think that, that we should just throw those things out. No. He says, now look at this. I had not known sin, but by the law. Do you understand? If you don't have the Old Testament, if you don't have the old law, how can you even know that you need a Savior? Yeah. You have to have it so that you will know where your standing is. So that you will become meek. So that you will become to the point to where you know you need a Savior. That's what the law is there for. That's what we said at the very beginning, isn't it? It says, it says, no, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known, what's the word? Lust. lust. I had not known lust or coveting, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. He didn't know that it was sin to go and look at your neighbor's house and wish that it was yours. I would say 98% of the Gentiles in America don't know that that's sin, do they? But somebody had better tell them that just by simply doing that you've committed sin. Now what are you going to do? Now you need to save you. Just by coveting their stuff. Paul's saying that just by coveting someone's... Hey, how can you control the sins of the mind? Oh, <laughs> it is a full-time job. Amen? Yes. That's why the minister comes in and says, oh, I need, I need prayer today. I need prayer. I need the Lord to increase my, my resistance. I need the Lord to help me to do what it is that would be pleasing to Him. Yes. Even in this relationship that I have with Jesus, even though Jesus has forgiven me of my sins, I need His help in order to walk in the direction He wants me to walk. Amen? Amen. I need His help. I can't do it on my own, and you can't either. 
And if you're truly, truly saved, you'll know you need Jesus. Amen. You will know you need more of Jesus. Amen. You will know you need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Amen. You need so much of the Spirit of God, there's no room for sin. Amen. That's why you want to say, be filled with the Spirit, right? Amen. Be filled with so much of Jesus. Put, put so much of Him in your life, there's not room for sin. Amen? It says this... Um, Verse 4, verse 8. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of what? Evil desires. Evil desires or coveting. Yes. For apart, listen, for verse, verse 7, verse 7, for, for conspicuous or apart from the law, sin is dead. <laughs> You understand? Yeah. We need the law because we need to understand that we have broken the law. Yeah. We understand, we need to understand <coughs> that we have to pay the penalty for what we've done. And now that we've understood that we have broken the law, that we are that we deserve punishment, then we have to look to the judge for mercy. Yes. Amen. That's what this is all about. Amen. We have to look to the judge for mercy. And we have to beg the judge for mercy. And the judge hands out. The judge is Jesus. And he hands out and he says, I'll tell you what. The judge has mercy. The judge has, the judge has compassion. The judge has forgiveness. If you will accept my payment, I will pay the penalty for your sins. Will you, will you accept that? He said, and, we, and think of if you accept that, the whole idea is it's just like Isaiah. It's just what Jesus said. If you will, I've got some good news. I've got some ty good tidings that I have come to have preached the acceptable day of the Lord to the meek. Yes. That means that you have come down before the Lord, got on your hands and knees, and realized, I need forgiveness. Yes. Well, I've got some good news. Jesus walks in. Amen? Amen. Amen. Oh, that's what we preach and that's what it should still be. Unfortunately, we have got so much... I don't even know if this is a word. Gobbledygook. We've got so much junk that's going on in this world that tries to completely mess up the Scriptures and mess up this and mess up that in order to mess up your brain into thinking you're accepting something that you're not or believing something that you're not. Hey, if anybody comes to you and preaches any other Jesus but the Jesus that we preached this morning, they Amen. let them be accursed. Amen. Because it is completely wrong. This is what our Jesus is. This is what He's done. And we need to stick to it. Amen? If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you have accepted Him, then you are in the family of God. You are there based upon your faith in Christ Jesus, Amen. not of works. Yes. Not of keeping the law. But I will tell you this right now. That if you have accepted Him as Christ Jesus. If you have accepted Him as your Lord and Savior. Then you need to live according to His directives. Yes. You need to live according to the, His rules and regulations. And if you stumble and if you fall. Then you need to get humble. And you need to get on your knees. And you need to beg Him for forgiveness. And you need to say I am so sorry that I messed up. Think of it. If you've done something bad to your parents, listen, if you've done something bad to someone who you love, or if you've messed up and you've done something that maybe they looked at that was just not good in the relationship, are you humble enough to go over to them and say, you know what? You know that I still love you. I still love you. But I want you to realize this. I'm sorry for what I did. Because it brought dishonor to you. That's the way we as Christians need to be. Yes. That's the way I need to be. That's the way we all need to be. Yes. Go to them and say, I am sorry. And, and don't say, I will do my best. No, no. You say, with your help, I can overcome those obstacles yes. and those sins that I've done. With your help, I can fix this. I can't fix it on my own. Is there anybody here like that this morning? We're going to do communion. We're going to do that this morning. Is there anybody here who says, you know, hey, I need the Lord's help. I need the Lord's help to live a life that is pleasing to Him. If that's you this morning, I'm going to have a, maybe a song. Could you play something softly? Whatever you want. Softly and tenderly. Whatever you want. Jesus, I come. That's good. I, I'm so desperately asking you, please get it right between you and the Lord. I want you to discern what Jesus has done for you. We've talked about the good news. If you've 
you've accepted Him as your personal Savior, then you continue to pray for those who need to get things right with Him and the Lord. 